QSO Today, episode 256, Stephen Bible and 7 HPR. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for the radio amateur that are ready to enhance your contest season now. And by QRP Labs, Hans Summer G0 UPL's QRP Radio Kit Company. Hans has an amazing catalog of radio kits and parts for every budget. I want to thank both ICOM and QRP Labs for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. Stephen Bible, N7HPR, had made a career in the Navy, spending almost two years underwater on the U.S. Trident submarine. Steve is a longtime contributor to Tapper, the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio Corporation, perhaps our Bell Labs of amateur radio. Steve and I discuss his ham radio story and the developments of Tapper and its contributions to our wonderful hobby. N7HPR, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Steve? Hello, Eric. Steve is here. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? You know, you always kind of think back to when and where you got the idea of ham radio. All I can think of is I was a very young boy. I got I know that I got interested in electricity at age seven. And it was from reading a book, um, probably a library book of the sorts, and and was fascinated by basically batteries and light bulbs. Would that be and, Alfred P. Morgan's uh, first electrical book for boys, maybe? Ah, uh, goodness, who knows? I In really those days, don't. public school libraries. Uh, well, we we went to the. Um, my mother was a voracious reader, so we were always going to the neighborhood library, the city library. Mm. And this is when I was living in the northern part of Phoenix. Um, there's an area there called Sunny Slope, and that's the area that I had grown up in. And it's not necessarily a high-tech area, but I, my young interests were definitely developing into the technical areas early on. And in those days, you know, your information came from books and, and magazines, so I basically read as many books and as many magazines as I possibly could. I'm sure I probably came across ham radio in uh, the amount of reading. And, of course, I could see in the na- neighborhoods, distance neighborhoods, um, ones that I couldn't walk to. I, you know, you could see the, the towers and the antennas and homes and stuff. And I did learn that, you know, hey, you could have an Elmer – and I uh, thought, my goodness, if I could just find an Elmer, then that would certainly be my pathway into to ham radio. Now, a slight sidetrack, I did have a neighbor who was had a shortwave radio, and I used to go over to their house and spend the evenings listening to shortwave, and that was also fascinating to sit there and listen to far-off uh, radio stations and develop your sense of geography by pinpointing where these signals were coming from. So the two of those together were were kind of making a really good match. Did you have magazine subscriptions as a kid? No, it just basically bought them off the shelf. Uh, And what were your your favorite reads? Popular electronics, um, electronics now were the ones that I remember um, back in the Late 60s, early 70s, you know, there was quite a few electronics magazines that you could actually choose from um, on the newsstand. So I read as many of of those as I could. And what had happened was in the eighth grade, uh, our English class, we were uh, doing public speaking. So we were to get up in front of the class and talk about whatever subject we wanted. And I decided to talk about transistors. So you can probably imagine, you know, eighth grade English class, um, 13 years old, getting up and talking about transistors. I bet it was a a real interesting subject for all the rest of my classmates. But as it turned out, my English teacher was a ham. Really? And so so, um, he took me under his wing and I would stay after class and he taught me the Morse code. And that's how I got my start. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Do you remember his name and call sign? No, I don't. That's something I need to dig in some chest and try to find uh, a yearbook from that and, and find his his name. And then I'll probably have to look in some of the older call books. Uh, 
he was an older gentleman even in in school time so i'm sure he's sk by now well speech i think speech class was a requirement in uh, eighth grade in california schools and i remember speaking about electronics and everyone's eyes glazing over so what happened after that he he taught you the morris code did he also give you the more the uh, novice test no he he did not so <laughs> It's funny because, you know, as a kid and especially a young teenager entering high school and then discovering girls, you know, you go through a lot of different uh, tracks. But I continued to teach myself uh, a lot of electronics through the high school years. And and finally, I decided that electronics would be a career for me. And uh, graduating out of high school, I uh, decided to join the military and my goal was to research each of the military branches and see who had the best electronics program. And this is 1976-77, and the answer was the Navy. And the Navy had what they had called advanced electronics program. So I joined up with the Navy, uh, went through their electronics program, became what's called a data systems technician, who is the technician that uh, repairs basically the mainframe computers that are on board ship. So it was a couple of years in the Navy and uh, ran into another fellow that was a ham. I was over at his house visiting and noticed there was a couple of Yezu HTs and chargers. So now we're a lot further ahead and the, um, the VEC exams are now in place. And uh, he uh, taught me the Morse code. I studied up on the questions and then went to a local VEC program, which I think that was a wonderful thing because prior to the VEC program, especially growing up in Arizona, uh, it only the FCC came to the city of Phoenix like once every six months. So it was really a challenge for a young boy, um, you know, who only had a bicycle <laughs> to get around. <laughs> so um, I finally got my license after all those years and, and, of course, you know, learning and working in electronics all along the way and then just, you know, grinning from ear to ear. I really en enjoyed the fact that I finally got my license after so many attempts. Do you remember what year and how old you were? Yeah, so that would be 1985, 26 years old. But the seed was planted long ago at the age of, of seven with electronics. And then the eighth grade, you know, you're around 13 years old. The, the seed was definitely planted very early. And it was something that I was not going to give up on. And, and it was just, you know, for some folks, it's, it's easy if you have family or friends that, that can help you through, through the process. But if you don't, then, you know, trying to to find it and find that path is a bit of a challenge. So for me, it took a little bit longer until I really came across the right circumstances, the right frame of mind, and the, the right friends to be able to help you out. Now, how long did you spend in the in the Navy? So I spent uh, 23 years in the Navy. So I retired in March of 2000, um, left the Navy as a nuke, a nuclear uh, power officer. I was halfway through my enlisted career, was picked up for what they call the enlisted commissioning program. They sent me to university, got my computer engineering degree, volunteered for Admiral Rickover's Navy, and was accepted and went through the nuclear power pipeline, which was proverbial drinking from the fire hydrant. And then all this time, you know, my original intent in joining the Navy was you know, to learn electronics, start my career, get the GI Bill, and get the hell out. I just never got the hell out. <laughs> but it was all so that I could basically fund my education. So I got to learn my electronics. I got the computer engineering degree. I got the training uh, from the nuclear power and then proceeded to go on shipboard. And then I was a submarine officer for really? the next... 12 years. And did you spend a lot of time at sea as a submarine officer? I certainly did. I certainly did. If yeah, I was on what we call Trident submarines, which is our ballistic missile submarines, I was stationed out of um, Kings Bay, 
Georgia and also Bangor, Washington. And if you put basically all my patrols back to back, um, over two years of my life is underwater. Wow. What was that like? I would think um, at first you might feel claustrophobic. Well, they definitely put you through a lot of rigor, psychological tests and, and training before they even put you on board your first submarine. And, of course, you volunteer to go submarine. So in the Navy, we, we say that uh, submariners tend to be kind of a cut above the average sailor because they volunteered twice. And, and that's pretty true. I mean, on board, you, you really have some really hardworking people. And the environment, you know, it, there's there's the people you work with. So a Trident submarine can have 175 people on board. So, yeah, it's pretty cramped quarters. Um, but the Trident is a much newer, much larger submarine than, than a lot of the ones you might see in the movies, let's say. And when you're on patrol, how long would you stay submersed? Six uh, For three months. So you, you come into port every once in a while, or are you, are you actually out at sea for three months? Okay, so the way a ballistic missile submarine has two crews, the blue and the gold crew, and we would uh, change crews on the submarine. In other words, it's perhaps one of the better taxpayer-funded war machines and that it's always at sea. So there's a crew that's manning the ship and taking it to sea, like I said, for three months, while the off-crew is on shore training. So going through a lot of training exercises, getting ready for the ship to come back. When the ship comes back to port, the crews exchange the ship, ownership of the ship. So now the on crew does maintenance, gets the ship ready to go out on patrol again, while the off crew takes a couple of weeks break and then goes through a training cycle. Well, that's very interesting. So when they're at sea, they are you're actually submersed for three months. Yes. Wow. That's what submarines do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never actually talked to anybody that's been on a Trident submarine. Uh, it must be the closest thing to being in a space capsule. You know, I, I, I want, of course, there's a lot of fascination with the space program. Again, you know, going back to my beginnings, you know, I was a youngster during the 60s when the, the Gemini and the Apollo program. So I was glued to the television watching those. And I'm sure that had a lot of influence on my choices in life. And of course, uh, before I was born in 1958 was the launch of Sputnik, which a lot of hams, uh, old timers had an opportunity to actually hear that satellite and started the so-called space race. And so I'm a child of that. So I would say that becoming a ham has a lot to do with the space race in the United States then putting a lot of emphasis in math and science and influenced, uh, you know, a several generations probably. But as I watch those, um, watch the astronauts, whether they be Apollo or Skylab or even the Soyuz, uh, the Russian uh, space station, right, and also, um, you know, International Space Station today, it's just, I watch that, and a lot of their atmosphere uh, conditioning is very similar to the atmosphere conditioning that we use on the submarine. And, of course, the close quarters uh, is also another. And the isolation, you know, you're not going to just step out and, you know, go home after the end of day's work there. You know, you live and work in the same place. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, and as a nuclear power engineer, that was your job on board the submarine, was to make sure everything, all systems are go? <laughs> Basically. So the modern submarine officer today, um, all of them are trained in nuclear power. There's only one officer that's not, and that's the supply officer. And your job is submarine warfare. It's not a matter of you're either a communications officer or navigator or engineer, you know, you learn all of the jobs. And for a short period of time, you will work each of the jobs, so to speak, because your goal, your career path, so to speak, is to become a commanding officer of a submarine. 
So when you start out as a junior officer, you're going to do a lot of the smaller jobs, then rotate to shore for a couple of years, then you rotate back to the ship as a department head. You'll serve as a department head for about three years, rotate to shore, rotate back to the ship as an executive officer, rotate to shore for a short period of time, and then rotate back for a commanding officer tour. Now, naturally, not everybody makes it all the way up through this pyramid, and you have lots and lots of junior officers at the very beginning, and of course, they're going to decide whether or not they want to make the Navy a career or not and get out or continue their career or just see how far they can go. And now this message from ICOM America. Heard it, worked it, logged it. Now that field day has passed, we enter the contest season and hopefully more time to get on the air. It's time to get the ICOM transceiver that's best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products. Make the most of of out-of-the-summer and contest season with one of these great ICOM rigs. The IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants and just in time for contest season. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest of signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The new ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio, SDR, that will change the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. The ICOM7610 features include RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. The IC7300 has changed the way an entry-level HF transceiver is designed. The rig is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. I purchased one myself last fall and can tell you that the ICOM 7300 is as good or better than any rig I've ever had. The ICOM IC7300 includes RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, internal antenna tuner, and an SD card memory slot. No matter which ICOM rig you choose, you'll be a winner. Be sure to check out these fine rigs at www.icomamerica.com or click on the banner on the QSO Today show notes page. And when you finally go to make your ICOM purchase, be sure to tell the dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. My thanks to ICOM America for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. And now back to our QSO. I'm looking here at your academic publications, and one of those publications you actually co-wrote with two other people, using spread spectrum ranging techniques for position tracking in a virtual environment. Does this referring to the submarine life in terms of trying to figure out where you are? No, it wasn't. That So, as I mentioned, applied for and got picked up for the Navy's uh, listed commissioning program was accepted into the nuclear power program. So that was six, um, 18 months of training that alone. Went to my first submarine, the USS Georgia, up in uh, Washington. And then when my time was to rotate to shore, there's various assignments that are available at the time. One of those was to be a student at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. So since I joined the Navy for an, for an education, then I put in for that and got accepted. So then I'm shipped off to Monterey, California for two years to work on a master's degree. That sounds like pretty tough duty, Monterey, California. It was. It, 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 it was an, an incredible place, an incredible environment, beautiful location, and, you know, couldn't be a better place to, to basically kick back and learn. And it was a wonderful school. I was a bit afraid that uh, the Naval Postgraduate School would just be full of white males, but it turned out I was wrong. The Naval Postgraduate School has actually 40, 40 different countries' militaries studying there for their master's degree. So it's a very international school. So the United States invites other countries to send their military people there too. So you're literally in class with all kinds of nationalities and even your neighbors in the the housing complex are international. So it was just an incredible environment. So then I took up um, studying computer engineering again. And uh, one of the classes I took is 
virtual reality. And the professor that was over the virtual reality there at the time was Michael Zida, who's one of the top researchers in virtual reality at the time. And this is the early 90s. And um, Mike knew my background in ham radio. And he had asked me to write a paper about, is it possible to use the global positioning system to track people in a virtual environment? And at first, I didn't really think it was possible. So I'm off to the library reading all about um, global positioning system. And then the epiphany hit me one day is this, yes, this could actually be done. So that's what that paper is all about. Now, it appears to me, though, that um, spread spectrum became something of interest because you have other papers that you've written for the amateur radio community as well on sp spread spectrum. What is sp spread spectrum, and why are we not using it? I have the impression when when people say spread spectrum to me that it's a uh, like a military radio communications technology that's stealthy. Maybe I've got it all wrong, but that's that that's kind of you know m the thinking that I've that I've heard on this, and so therefore, and it seems to me that we don't have any spread spread spectrum technology that we're using at the moment in amateur radio. So I'm just wondering if there's a connection. Okay, so I would say that perhaps a lot of the baby boomers would kind of consider spread spectrum a, a military stealthy. In our history, there's a lot of technology was discovered and developed because of World War II. And World War II was a moment in our history and lifetime in which a great deal of technology was used in the war effort. And spread spectrum came about in the war effort because of radar. So it wasn't a communications medium to begin with. It was because of making radar better. And radar was still an early technology and it was kept very secret, the development of radar and its capabilities, because it was basically a secret weapon. And um, fast forward several years, of course, the, the, war, the war is over. Now everyone comes home. A lot of these projects get declassified. We find out you know, uh, about these technologies. The men and women that had worked on these technologies now are in the civilian sector, and, and the question is for a lot of these corporations and small businesses is, okay, what can I do with this technology in the civilian sector? Um, radar and spread spectrum continues to be um, classified, and, and there's not a lot of public information on that. It's not until the 1970s when the FCC proposes that uh, spread spectrum be a communications medium for the industrial and scientific and medical ban, ISM ban. And now we have the rules and regulations um, as of 1985 that, you know, we can have spread spectrum in our ISM bands. And this is where Bluetooth comes from and especially Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is spread spectrum. Bluetooth is spread spectrum. So we use these every day. I mean, it's I think for most um, youngsters, I mean, spread spectrum is so is is as common as fresh water and and lights, you know, sunlight. So it's not it's kind of a generation thing uh, along those lines. Now, along the lines of spread spectrum and amateur radio, AMRAD in Washington D.C. began uh, doing some spread spectrum experimentation in the ham bands. The AWRL published um, a lot of their work in QST, and then it was put into an anthology book called the Spread Spectrum Source Book, which is no longer sold. So perhaps at a ham fest, you might find this, this out-of-print book, and it's well worth reading. It's really fascinating. And hams, of course, always love to learn about new things. And this is kind of getting into, you know, my role in Tapper is, you know, the 80s brought about um, packet radio. It was literally a, a paradigm shift for ham radio. Um, there was really no other mode very similar like it. So it was just this, you know, magical thing that just all of a sudden landed 
in everybody's laps. And that certainly fascinated the world. And of course, today we still have packet in very much the same in the same formats as it was uh, back in the 80s, uh, regretfully. But that packet radio probably spawned a lot of careers, um, a lot of hams uh, taken a fascination of pa packet radio, and then they went on to um, develop our. Uh, Wi-Fi, our Bluetooth, and our cellular telephone technology that we have today because of packet radio. A good example of that is um, the AWRL had what they called the Computer Networking Conference, the CNC, and each year was call for papers and technical presentations. And it was in the ninth year presentation or the ninth uh, version of the CNC, Phil Karn had presented a paper, Phil Karn, KA9Q, presented a paper on MACA and MACA. So it was a medium access control um, protocol. And that one proceedings sold hundreds, if not thousands of copies of that. And MACA is actually in Wi-Fi. It's actually in cellular technologies. So even the ham can make huge contributions to the technologies that today we pretty much take for granted. So to kind of say, you know, where is spread spectrum today in ham radio? It kind of is alive and well, especially when hams repurpose um, Wi-Fi. Right. So like in Arden networks or... The repurposing of uh, access points for uh, building amateur radio links, for example. Correct. And so there's your spread spectrum. There's been um, a few attempts at, at building spread spectrum radios, you know, uh, from scratch. But as it is, you've got a lot of chipsets now that will that will do spread spectrum. So there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, if somebody wanted to build a frequency hopping spread spectrum radio today, it's very easy to do. There's chipsets out there. There's algorithms. There's software you can tap into. Just takes a little bit of elbow grease just to to put them all together and bolt it together, and away you go. Yeah, we've. I think we've really benefited from the proliferation of you know smartphones and everything else that creates all of these uh, very cheap chipsets now for all kinds of projects. You mentioned earlier, you mentioned Tapper, and I wanted to go there. What is Tapper? How did it start, and how did you get involved in it? So Tapper stands for the Tucson Amateur Packet Radio Corporation that started in Tucson, Arizona in the early 80s as the uh, group that developed the first terminal node controller number one. Now, they weren't the first in amateur packet radio. That goes to Canada, to VADCA, the, the Vancouver area amateur radio club. So if we go back to the 70s, early 80s, um, ASCII was not allowed on the United States amateur radio bands. So there had to be a petition to get that changed before packet radio could even come to the United States. And um, a group of fellows from uh, Tucson who were also IEEE members were went to a conference and was learning about this packet technology. And there being hams knew about what um, VADCA was doing and decided, hey, let's get together and, and let's do this ourselves and came up with a design that is known as the TNC-1. And it was a raving success as a kit. Uh, it was fairly easy to connect it to a two meter FM radio via push to talk and, and the audio and speaker and then improved upon that design making it a, a smaller, more compact design, which is the TNC-2, which most people are familiar with because many, many of the TNCs were uh, TNC-2s or their clones because Tapper then licensed that design to a number of companies to, to build. And you'll see a lot of those around. And so it was the um, fascination of this technology basically – um, computers were starting to show up in 
the ham shack doing a variety of things. And here was a way to do computer to computer communications over amateur radio rather than just keyboard to keyboard as RTTY is. And, you know, hams are just inquisitive people and they just the the enjoyment is tinkering with these different technologies. Let me take a quick break here to tell you about my favorite amateur radio audio podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KG6VU, and Jeremy, KF7IJZ, where they pursue topics, technology, and projects on their Ham Radio Workbenches every two weeks. George and Jeremy document their projects and make circuit boards available for sale to their listeners. They have interesting guests and go in deep. Even if you're a seasoned Ham Radio builder or just getting started, be sure to join George and Jeremy for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. Use the link on this week's show notes page by clicking on the image. And now back to our QSO today. How did you become involved in Tapper? So this is basically going, when I got my license uh, in 85, I, I was also picked up for going to university. So this is, uh, I'm going to the University of Utah, working on my computer engineering degree, in 1985, I graduate there in 1988, and packet radio was just the rage, and joined up with the uh, uh, Packet Utah group, and it was just having a great time. And then I used it in my senior project. I had, along with a group of other students, colleagues, we designed and built a packet accessible a weather station, which we built. It worked, and we demonstrated it, and we left it there for the club uh, to take care of it ever since. And um, I don't think it's still up on the air, but it was for a little while after we had left. Does Tapper have engineering priorities and interests? What determines the Tapper direction? Because it looks like it's gone in different ways over the period of time. And that's true. So it's it's fascinating when your interest is in technology and your interest is in okay what is the the next new shiny thing and packet radio was definitely that shiny thing in the 80s and come around the early 90s we start to see the inroads um you know the internet is starting to take and i always see May of 1995 as a watershed moment. And in that month was when AOL and CompuServe connected to the internet. And perhaps from 1995 onward, there were more dot coms than there was dot mills and, and dot edus. And with Packet was really great for emails and for bulletin boards. Of course, we had dial-ups at the time, which were expensive because we had to pay um, for um, telephone landline time, especially if it was long distance. And of course, if you're a ham in a rural area, you it tends to be even more expensive because every, everything is a long distance call. And what we see is uh, Bob Berninga, um, WB4APR, then develops the uh, APRS, Automatic Position Reporting System. And there's a lot of interest in that. So Tapper then basically takes an interest in it because its members are interested in it and help develop it and, and promote APRS. And that was done uh with Bob Berninga in a number of ways, the uh, there was a lot of different hardware projects developed, a lot of software projects that were were developed, books written, and talks that that were given. Then we get into um, let's say 2000. I'll back up. I'll I'll put a bookmark here at 2000, but I'm going to back up to 1995 again. I believe. Uh, Somehow in my mind, it's 1995. So I'm walking in the library, kind of didn't really have a lot to do. So I was going to go to the magazine area and, and look at what uh, IEEE publications were, were on display there. And if I recall correctly, uh, 
and it, it, I'm, I'm missing the month, but I think it's 1995. There was a special issue of Software Defined Radio, by, and the editor was Joe Mitola. And I took it down and literally read it cover to cover and, sa- and thought to myself, this is the, a, a really exciting, cool thing. I mean, how cool is it that software is the radio? And of course, being a ham, being inquisitive, then then there's this rush to say to see what can we do with this technology and amateur radio. And Spread Spectrum has a lot to do with that, doing a lot of studying with the Spread Spectrum from the work that I was doing with Mike Zida. I was also working with the Space Lab there. They were developing a satellite called Pansat, which was launched by John Glenn on one of the uh, shuttle missions, and it was a spread spectrum satellite. And so there's a lot of technology, a lot of fascination. So fast forward to 2000, there's an article, three-part article in uh, QST on the DSP-10 by Bob Larkin. And I'm reading this article, and it's a how to build it. And there's a basically a components list. You can buy this uh, printed circuit board from him. And I'm reading through this whole thing. I give Bob Larkin a phone call and I said, this, Bob, this is a software defined radio. And he said, yes, it is. He said, but the QST editors didn't want to call it that at the time. So you had such a new technology that you tend to have to use familiar ter- terms for for the audience as you're easing them into these this new jargon, new methods, and, and new technologies. And it really wasn't until a few years later that we started to see software-defined radio uh, articles. So I asked Bob if it was permissible if Tapper kitted the DSP-10 and sell it, which he agreed to. So we built well over 300 kits and sold those uh, to people. Uh, so uh, software defined radio defines a lot of what Tapper's doing in the in the 2000s, and you know we're kind of fast forwarding to today, and we see that um, as each of these technologies that Tapper gets involved with, one of the things that we decided to do is once the technology becomes mainstream, and once the technology can be purchased from other vendors then Tapper will back away from it and try to find what's what's the next big thing. And it's always kind of a search out there to find, okay, what is the next big thing and what are we going to find interest in? And that's the key. As a volunteer organization, you don't just pick up a technology for the sake of picking it up. You're picking it up because the membership is actually interested in it. And what we're working with today is with the HamSci community that got started up about um, three years ago um, and where they're doing citizen science. And we're working with the HamSci organization and helping them engineer and develop and hopefully sell in the future a personal space weather station. And this way, HAMS can use the amateur frequencies to study space weather and propagation and provide their readings back to a central database, which would then would be a worldwide network and contribute to the science of space weather. So Tapper is kind of like the Bell Labs of the amateur radio world. Can can I say that? Oh, that's the best compliment I've ever heard for Tapper. <laughs> Thanks. I always think of the folks at Tapper as being on the cutting edge of amateur radio technology. So I guess I've interviewed a number of Bell Labs former employees who happen to be ham radio operators, or maybe they were ham radio operators who became Bell Labs employees. But this is what comes to my mind right now. Steve, have we like squeezed all of the the life out of software defined radio is there is there more that we can do that we're not doing now good question where so i mentioned that the AWRL created the computer networking conferences the cnc's and those were for the most part they were annual each of those have printed proceedings and then in 1996 Tapper entered into a uh, memorandum of understanding with the AWRL 
and joined with the AWRL to put together the successor to the CNC, which is now called the, the Digital Communications Conference, or DCC. So Tapper's been involved, and, and AWRL's been involved uh, jointly in um, the the DCC since 1996. All right, so, okay, give me a hand again. Yeah, so, <laughs> so what, I, they, I was asking whether or not we've, we've squeezed all the life out of right, software-defined right. radio design. Is there any more we can do? So the, um, where I'm going with that is when we had the DCC in the Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida area, um, the Sunday seminar is a four-hour time period that, that we devote to basically deep dive a subject. And so we invited Bob McGuire and 4HY to talk. Um, he is a professor at um, Virginia Tech. And in answering your question, basically – uh, Bob said, yeah, software-defined radio has been basically researched, uh, you know, to the end. I suppose you could say it's um, – there's not a lot of new that can be learned from it. And, of course, that's always a dangerous statement to say because somebody can always re resurrect the technology. Something changes that uh, renews interest in it again. But basically, the research on software-defined radio from research institutions has waned because the new topic now is cognitive radio. And cognitive radio is a term that – remember I mentioned Joe Maitola being the special editor to that IEEE communications um, issue. Um, he's the one that termed the phrase software-defined radio. He, a few years later – coined a second term called cognitive radio. So what we have now today, uh, and we see it a lot in the news, you know, artificial intelligence, that's been a technology that's been under study since the 70s in, in the computer science realm. The reason why it's kind of resurrected itself today is because the masses of amounts of computing power and memory that we have now. And cognitive radio is smart radio. You, as a ham, turn on your radio, you tune to the 20 meter band, you know what your low limit is, you know what your high limit is, and you tune across the band looking for an opening to either call CQ or perhaps you're dialing across uh, listening for a CQ. Cognitive radio, you turn it on and heaven knows what band it's going to choose. Okay, It's looking out there for Let's say you want to call CQ, so you tell your radio, you know, find a clear channel, and it will. In an open band. And in, 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 let's say your license, let's say, uh, so the present frequency model that we live under is the real estate model. The ham bands have been likened to the national parks of the frequency spectrum. The national parks are open to the public. You know, the public's allowed to, to use those for recreational purposes, not for business purposes. And we're given this little slice. Well, in the cognitive radio world, there is no real estate. Uh, you, you literally look at the whole electromagnetic spectrum and you just say, OK, what's the best propagation from let's say, the Western United States to Europe. Uh, and the cognitive radio will find that frequency for you that gives you the, the propagation that will get you to Europe. So it, it's very knowledgeable of what bands are available to it, what, um, what's open, what's not open, you know, the propagation, the whole bit. And so if this is the research area now, is this this world of cognitive radio, the ability to reuse frequencies, the ability to allow even more participants on the frequencies and to be able to um, put them on their, you know, interference free. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. It seems to me that, you know, from a co cognitive standpoint, I guess it, you could leverage all of the DX clusters and uh, PSK monitors and all this stuff uh, across the world to tell your radio exactly what band to be in and um, where to look for the DX without having to think about it. Yeah, the, the, there, 
it, it would be that collective knowledge would all come together. And that's true. And with additional knowledge that the radio has made of the frequency band on its own. So it, it brings a whole different way of communicating hams and SWL listeners. The recreation is the hunt. Cognitive radio kind of, <laughs> you know, you just say, I want to talk to Europe, you know, right. and it's almost an instant dial up. So what will cognitive radio it's shooting fish in a barrel? It can it can be because it's where is the fun? Where is the recreation that hams have? And, and of course, we can always maintain that. But you can see where cognitive radio has huge implications to the world, the commercial world, the military world, where, you know, they just need to communicate. Right. So it's it's definitely an apple and an orange there. So it, what can we do as hams and cognitive radio today? And I'm sure we're going to see a lot of clever ideas. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. What has been the most complex Tapper project to date? Well, the DSP-10 was definitely a complex kit to put together, but uh, Bob had already designed it, so it was just a matter of <laughs> buying the parts. Uh, some of the stuff that John Ackerman and 8UR puts together for the timing community, so another area that Tapper's involved in is precision timing. Um, there's a group of recreational time nuts out there and that's what they call themselves time nuts and their goal is just to do absolute precision timing which is a fascinating area to study and get involved with and there are incredible things you can do communications wise and a lot of hams already experience in that with uh, modes like ft8 and the way it works is you got to have somewhat precision timing, you know, from a, a timing source of some sort. Right. Could it be a um, GPS receiver with a 10 megahertz output, for example, right? Right. Exactly. Right. So the, cause then you could do what's called a priori, um, listening. If you know what you're listening for, then you have a better chance of picking it out. Uh, back to the, the most complicated question, uh, back in the 90s, we were attempting to build a frequency hopping spread spectrum radio. Not a very easy thing to do. It, it took a couple of, of very smart Tapper members to work on it. What had happened was we were designing a, a great deal of it with the semiconductors of the day and the semiconductor company, I'll leave nameless <laughs> to keep them keep from embarrassing them right embarrassing them exactly uh, they kept discontinuing the chips and so literally we went through two or three redesigns because the chips were were discontinued the third second or third time we just threw our hands up and said okay that's it we can't build this it's just too complicated um, it takes us a longer time to do the design because it takes your volunteer time to do it, and with parts being obsoleted so fast, it had to be something that you designed quickly and did your parts order and, and got them built before they were obsoleted again. Can the average ham enjoy a Tapper conference? Yes, I'm very confident of that. There's all kinds of subjects. It's really within your 
mind what you feel is advanced or, or perhaps not or easy to you. The best way to um, know if you'll enjoy a digital communications conference is to view the more than 200 talks that we've recorded, video recorded, and are up on YouTube. And all you have to do is just do a sat search for Tapper DCC videos, and uh, they'll all pop up. They've been recorded since um, the early, yeah, the la latter part of the 90s to, oh, I take that back. No, no, no. Um, they've been recorded since um, the mid-2000s to present. Okay, good. We should get back, get back to ham radio, although talking about Tapper is ham radio. Uh, what's your current rig look like? So right now, uh, my son is also a, a ham, and he's a, the president of his ham club. And I've been helping him out. We've been goofing off a lot with um, – I gave him my ICOM 706, uh, and then uh, we've been working on trying to get an APRS node put up to be able to uh, put up a digipeter in, in kind of a, a dark area. My present rig right now is, is FT817 because I like to be able to go portable with it and um, and travel around, put up a long wire as, as we go. So you're a QRP operator. I guess you could say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm also a QRO operator. Um, my current home where I live now in the Phoenix area um, – live next to some industrial power lines. So HF is not very good here. So one of these years, uh, probably uh, retire and move to a, the country where I can have a little more quieter area and then put up a tower and, and an antenna. What's your favorite operating mode? Uh, I enjoy the voice. I enjoy the, you know, the digital modes as well. Uh, my favorite all time has been satellite. I was very active in the satellite scene in the 90s. Oscar 13 was what we call a DX satellite, and I just had a blast with Oscar 13 and working DX stations around the world under her footprint. Now, you wrote an article in 1995, and I was just curious, um, called The World Wide Web Amateur Satellite Ground Station, and I'll put a link to that uh, PDF file in the in the show notes page. Did you foresee when you wrote uh, that article where you actually built an a, a amateur radio ground station, connected it to a computer, and then connected to the Internet, that it might be possible at some, some point to crowdsource uh, amateur radio earth stations for passing satellites? Well, I think, um, yeah, it's it's interesting that the word crowdsource, it's been uh, coined here in the past few years. I really do believe hams probably had the, the concept of crowdsourcing long ago. It's just a matter of, of um, advertising it because Tapper and putting um, – together its open HPSDR project, which is also was a very difficult project. It was the manufacturing of these, um, basically going out, finding out what the interest was, gathering money, and then uh, buying the parts and building them and shipping them. Um, to the tune of the satellite station, I, say, I would say yes, because the, I've always seen hams do really clever things. And it is out of purely just for the pure fun of it. And, you know, how interesting would this be? And it's more trial and error where, well, let's give this a try. I'm interested in it. Let's see if it sticks. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't there. But what I love about the Digital Communications Conference and the talks that are there and the people that attend and the networking is – the sharing of ideas. That, that's the one thing that excites me about this technical side of the hobby. It really gives me uh, a warm feeling when uh, at a DCC, somebody gets up and says a talk and says, at DCNC so-and-so, I saw this talk and spoke with this person and I got this idea. And the the sharing of ideas is what really gives clever things their seed to grow. So by putting that station together, that was something that was just purely out of the fun of it. Can, let's see if I can pull this off 
It was brand new technology of the day. I mean, the World Wide Web came about in the early 90s, 90, well, I remember 1993 where Mosaic came out. I, I'm, I have to go back and look at the date when Tim Berners-Lee invented um, HTML and the World Wide Web. But it was all so doggone new. And um, I had internet access before it became truly commercial in the, the, before 1995. And it was just a fascinating time to basically bolt all those together and see if I could really pull this off, which I did. And a lot of people were really amazed on it. And I went around and gave several talks on that. So hopefully that gave other people ideas that they could go on and, and create neat things themselves. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing amateur radio now? That, I think, is a tough question. I think when it comes to hobbies, of which amateur radio is, you have a lot of dynamics. Some are social uh, interactions with other hams. Uh, some of them are technical, uh, whether or not we can use a certain digital mode on the frequencies. And um, the other is basically opportunistic. If you kind of look at the history of ham radio, you can see that it tends to favor whatever can be easily salvaged. So if we go back to the FM movement, uh, you know, two meters and FM, that was purely because there was so much surplus equipment that could be found. And uh, you see DMR is really popular today. Okay, why? Because there's so much surplus equipment to be found. So on one hand, amateur radio grows because of surplus equipment. And on the other hand, ham radio grows because somebody does something really innovative and it's inexpensive to buy. And there's nothing cheaper than free software. So if you wanted to try FT8, it's all you have to do is get on the internet, download it, follow the instructions, make a very simple speaker and microphone interface to your radio, and you're up and running. So really the challenge is just attitudes and the ability to you know, get along with one another and have fun instead of holding it back. Um, it's definitely disheartening when a couple of youngsters get on a two meter repeater and the old timers shout them down. You know, that's not how you operate. And it's just kind of really makes your heart sink, you know, to see that. So I think ham radios in, in good stead. It's going through many of the same cycles it has for the past hundred years, so to speak. Um, we may not recognize it as a cycle. The longer you look at it, from the long view and read about its history and talk to the old timers, you can kind of see that it, it does go in cycles. What does it have for the future? I certainly hope that it continues to be that national parks that are out there and that, you know, we take care of, of them and use them in, in good stead. And most of all, just have fun. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? As I mentioned, the, the sharing of ideas and doing really clever things that are just of interest. I think a lot of hams are hams just because there's an intrinsic interest to it. You know, it just has a lot of fun and you don't really have any other explanation other than the fact that, you know, there's just some intrinsic enjoyment to that. So when I see people getting together at you know, say field day or getting together at a ham fest and having conversations and sharing stories with one another. To me, ham radio is a very social hobby and it's it's not as solitary as, you know, let's say RC airplanes or RC cars might be. Uh, but anytime you can join a club and share with others and learn from others, that's really where you get probably, in my opinion, the greatest enjoyment. So Tapper, to me, is that organization where we can share the ideas and share the enjoyment of doing the bleeding edge, the technical side of the hobby. Does Tapper have a magazine? 
it has a, a quarterly newsletter. It's called the Packet Status Register, and we post it on the uh, Tapper website, www.tapr.org. So you can find it there. And we've also scanned all the past uh, Tapper newsletters all the way back to the beginnings of, of the early 80s. So you can read everything online. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Do you have advice that you'll give to new or returning hams then? Well, it's, the advice is basically find what you enjoy. Um, the, ha- the hobby is, has many facets. And find that one facet that you enjoy. And as long as you enjoy it, keep doing it. If it starts to bore you, find another facet that it does. I think a lot of old timers hams um, found ham radio as a kid and th- turned it into a career. So there's um, a thought exercise I put together with I can share with you. Sure. So the thought exercise is this. Go around to a number of people, and the more variety, the better, but ask them this question. At what age did you first learn about or first become a ham radio operator? And I've done this with a number of people, and what I found was the age was very often between the ages of 12 and 14. And it kind of brought a bit of an epiphany that a lot of the lifelong hams that we interact with today began from the ages of 12 to 14. All right, so the thought exercise continues. Oh, yeah, I'm da-da. okay, you'll edit that out. So then take the que- next question. What was it at your age that interested you in amateur radio? And you're going to get a variety of answers there. Many of the old timers, it the answer is DX. You know, the fascination of listening and talking to stations at great distances. And then the third and final question is, what would ham radio have to be today to interest a 12 to 14 year old today? And this is where the conversation gets very, very interesting. And Many people will start saying, oh, they ought to learn CW or they they ought to learn about DX and all that. And I said, whoa, whoa, slow down. Wait a minute. Those are things that interest you when you were 12 to 14 years old. The question is, what would it take? What would ham radio have to have today in order to interest 12 to 14 year olds? And The point of the thought exercise is to really get into the heads of youngsters of today and their perception of the world as they have it and what would interest them in the hobby of ham radio. And it's very, very difficult for an old timer to do that. It's extremely difficult. They think about when they were kids and they think that the things that interest them when they were 12 to 14 year olds would be the same things that interest kids today, 12 to 14, which is not necessarily the case. So we kind of leave it at that and, and challenge them to find out what that thing is. What is that thing that would interest 12 to 14 year olds? A lot of what we do as old timers to the youngsters is we invite them into the hobby as long as they participate in the hobby in the ways we tell them to. Right. So we've set we've set aside we've set these certain policies, these certain cultures, these certain mores within amateur radio and we're enforcing them on the next generation. And if they agree to it, then they join. If they don't, they go on to do something else. Well, it's a you know, it's a very interesting question that that you're asking and I uh, If I put myself back in those days, I went to five elementary schools and three high schools all in Southern California, and moving from one place to the other was like moving across the world in those days because using the telephone was very expensive. So I know why I was interested in amateur radio, and that was to kind of bridge those gaps between all of those areas in Southern California where I was moving where I was a long way away. But I can see kids nowadays have worldwide communications in the palm of their hand Obviously, that's not going to be what interests them. So that's a great that's, that's a great thought exercise. Have you asked twelve to fourteen year olds today what they might be interested in? No, I haven't. I really haven't taken it to their level. 
Why is your son interested in ham radio? Well, he's seen me do it, you know, and I've I've taken him along with me. But I was a kid who grew up. My father was a a painter, uh, you know, painted houses, painted buildings. My mother was stay at home mom, and they were not familiar with this thing called ham radio. They it just you know, and how can they help you with something that, you know, they, they don't really have any experience with or I- any knowledge? You know, I'm still very thankful to my mom that we went to the library as often as we did. Hmm. And I was always off in the electronics. So my world was in books because that's really all that was available to me. Right. You knew where all the and, 613 books were. <laughs> and exactly. Right. The Dewey Decimal System. Exactly. So for kids today, it's um, a lot of us at work volunteer for a lot of the robotics programs that are available today. Uh, Dean Kamen uh, created the first robotics, um, first standing for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. And this program is definitely helping kids understand technology a lot better, get their hands on with technology. And the way the program works is it's an after-school program in which engineers in the area volunteer their time and go and help the kids, mentor the kids in the building of their robot, and then help them take it to the regionals where they do um, uh, competitions. And this is at the high school level. And then there's other robotics programs for uh, middle school and grade school, VEX Robotics for the middle schools and the Lego League for the um, elementary schools. So there's, it's a wonderful world to be a kid today. There's a lot of technical things out there to do. And it's just a matter of are they close enough to that place that they can either get to by walking or ride a bike or can their family drive them? Or Uber. They can Uber it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a different world today. <laughs> it is. And, and even Ubering, I mean, I've talked to a lot of college students. They can't afford Uber. Okay. So it's maybe for you and me, Uber's real cheap, but it's still expensive to starving students. Yes, that's true. What you're kind of saying is, I think, is is that, you know, we're in a ham radio renaissance, I think, right now in terms of the huge variety and spectrum of things to do. But maybe we're just not good listeners as old timers when we're talking to kids about ham radio. And and that, I believe that's a good way of saying it, because if you're going to mentor kids, you, you need to mentor them in their world, not so much your world. You're certainly allowed to reminisce and say, you know, back in my day, but you got to limit that. You got to allow the kid to be able to focus on the technology as it is today and how it's going to influence them for their their future. Steve, you've been a, a wonderful guest and a great sport. I really appreciate your talking to me about your ham radio experience in Tapper. I learned more about Tapper than I've ever learned about Tapper, and I hope that the the listeners will follow up and and look at Tapper as a place for the latest innovations. With that, Steve, I want to thank you so much for joining me on QSO today and wish you 73. And it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much, Eric, and best of 73 to you. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Stephen. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qso today and put in N7HPR in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. 
QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.